Hello and welcome to Social Educational Project School of IT Professionals, uh, Prof. IT. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, education. And I'm glad to uh, present you Anthony Tattersall, uh, Head of uh, Europe, Middle Asia and uh, Africa, Coursera. Was I correct? In Indeed. The... Yeah. Europe, at least in Africa. Okay, so I uh, wouldn't steal your time. The microphone is yours. All right, so first of all, let me bring up my slides. Okay, can you see that okay? Yep, right. Fantastic, all right, so I will, I will kick off. So, uh, so welcome everybody. Um, my uh, talk today is gonna be looking at uh, the evolution that we're seeing in higher education, uh, which has been very much uh, accelerated this year um, as a result um, of the pandemic. And obviously I think that acceleration is likely to continue into the year ahead. So I'm gonna run the slides. We should be about 20 minutes or so, and we may have some time for questions towards the end. So if we look at, just for anyone who doesn't know, first of all, just introducing Coursera. Um, Coursera as an organization has around 77 million people on the platform who are consuming content from a range of uh, content producers that come from primarily university background, so some of the leading universities in the world, and around 50 or so industry partners, organizations like Amazon and Google, uh, and IBM who create content um, that is related to their brand um, and is more uh, often more technically orientated or more kind of career outcome orientated. And we work with around uh, 6,000 institutions globally, working with a range of different businesses, governments and campuses, helping uh, individuals, businesses um, to, to upskill, to reskill and to improve career outcomes. Now we look at universities specifically today, there are a range of challenges that we're, we're seeing them having to grapple with. Uh, firstly, when the pandemic first hit, almost every university globally was shut down in terms of its campus offering and, and had to move online. And that has led to an expectation now that online is part of the way in which university programs will be run. And that a substantial portion of learning that will be actually counted for credit towards a degree program will also be based on either an online uh, methodology or some form of hybrid um, blended type of content uh, with both on campus and online elements participating. And it's not simply as simple as just engaging live over Zoom or even pre recording classes. It's about designing content that works for an online audience who are used to consuming content asynchronously in their own time in a way that's structured for that level of engagement. We're also seeing that there's a much bigger focus now on employability outcomes for students, um, particularly given that in many sectors of the economy, there's a concern that there'll be some form of recession kicking in as a result of the pandemic, but also we're seeing a continual acceleration of lots of historical jobs being automated in part or in full by AI and machine learning. And so for a student going into a university and committing three or four years of their time, for, for them, their decision-making criteria, there's a stronger than ever focus on ensuring that when they come out of that university program, they will have a job to go to and it will be a job that actually want to take on board that justified that investment of time. And so universities are definitely having a, an obligation to try and make sure that they're improving those employability outcomes for their students. The next challenge is around cost management and how you can, as a university, reduce the cost of delivering for credit learning. Uh, if students are going to be engaging with the university online as opposed to on campus, even if it's only for partial elements of that time, then there's a bigger demand for reduced fees and reduced spend with that university, given that you're not incurring the costs of on-site provision. And that is a cash flow challenge for many organizations. The other challenge that you have is that many uh, organizations are struggling to find how to actually increase the capacity of their student population, something that can of course help with cash flow 
if you can do so without increasing the existing facilities or the increasing the number of faculty staff. And by using online content that provides a mechanism for that to be done and, and create a better kind of cash flow or cash optimization for that institution. And the final part is also just how we keep the faculty themselves up to date. Technology is advancing ever quick, ever more quickly. <clears throat> and it's a challenge for faculty staff to stay up to date with the latest technology trends in particular, but also some of the more emerging human skills, critical thinking skills, emotional intelligence, working with diverse teams, working with systems and AI um, integrated teams. All these kind of capability sets um, are changing so frequently that there's a real challenge to keep the faculty up to date so the content remains relevant for the, uh, the, the job worlds that those students will be going into. On the graduate side, there's a real challenge in terms of the disruption that we're seeing. So automation as a result of things such as AI, machine learning, new technologies, and so on. The World Economic Forum estimates that about 85 million jobs are going to be displaced by 2025, which effectively means they're going to be um, gone from the working world in part or in full because they can be done through alternative means. And also within the roles that will be available, we're seeing that around 40% of the core skills required to do almost any role in employment today will also change by 2025. And those changes are going to be around ways of working, virtual engagement, utilization of technology in the role, and so on. Again, with many, many organizations as a result of the pandemic had to shift to remote working. And the expectation is that that's going to be largely continued, at least in some degree, for most organizations going forward. And 44% of the workforce are expected to work remotely on an ongoing basis post pandemic. Um, recognizing there's, there's benefits and value that can be driven from working from home. There's also benefits in a way that can be driven from an office based environment. And many organizations are now looking to blend the two and maybe move from an expectation where work was five days a week in the office to perhaps one or two days a week in the office or some more sort of flexible um, scheme that will be associated with it. And finally, we're seeing that there's that almost all businesses are trying to accelerate their digitalization programs. And that affects both the way they integrate, engage with their consumers um, and also the way they run their internal systems. But that is creating a significant demand for technical oriented skills and something that universities historically haven't been as strong as developing, at least at a literacy level, um, especially if it's not a program focused directly on it uh, and gendering those skill sets uh, in their students. We've also seen there's been a significant drop, certainly in the US and in many econ economies around the world, where actually um, entry level graduate position hiring has fallen significantly, 45% here in the US. And that of course creates a real challenge for university students when they find that first role to get into the ladder and then obviously drive themselves uh, through the promotional path or career development path into other roles from that point onwards. So, at least for the foreseeable future or the short-term future, there's likely to be an intensified competition and that's gonna be particularly relevant um, where students are coming out with degrees that don't have a technical orientation in some way or form. The other side of the triangle is that we're also seeing that employers um, are focusing a lot more now on skills first hiring. In other words, it's not just about having a degree from a recognized institution, but it's about the skill sets that you can bring into the role. And most of these companies have their own skills development programs that they're deploying and they're running. And they know exactly the skill sets that they need to um, reskill their population to and want to have. So if you can evaluate a student um, or an entry level worker coming in for the skill sets that they have, and they have those skills that are relevant to your business, it becomes less relevant whether that's being taught through a degree program or is being taught through different means. And so I think we will see some disruption into how people are evaluating entry level positions from a business perspective. So one of the challenges is that we're seeing in the market right now is there is a mismatch between the skills that students are coming out of education institutions with and the skills that businesses believe that they need in their workforce. And whilst there can be some different, different opinions about the relevancy of skills that perhaps aren't um, company or industry specific, 
there's a definite view from business that there are skill sets that they are looking for digital literacy skills in particular, some of the kind of um, communication skills, business level skills, um, uh, critical thinking skills and so on, that are almost core to every organization that, that universities can definitely improve their game in terms of ensuring their students lead with them. And if you look at where the emerging job opportunities are that are gonna require these kind of base level digital skills, it's clearly very much around technology. So there's about 149 million new jobs anticipated um, from this future job survey by 2025. And they are primarily in tech oriented disciplines. The vast majority of those are in software development. But you also have lots of cloud and data roles, data analysis, things associated with machine learning, and AI, cybersecurity, privacy, trust, data protection, and so on. So if you're working one of these spheres, then you've got a lot more opportunity because at the moment there is more demand than there is supply of people in those roles. And that's why companies are often reskilling their internal workforce to take on these disciplines. But if you're coming out of university and you're not in the tech domain, if you have an arts degree or a humanities degree, or you have a general business studies degree or something like this, and you're not building some of these more data literacy skills, it will become very, very much more difficult to secure those entry-level positions if you're competing someone which has a background in these skill sets for one of these types of roles. So one of the things that we're seeing starting to happen, at least in some of the uh, campuses around the world, is that there's a recognition that a, a, a university or a higher educational institution doesn't have to own everything that they deliver in terms of educational content. That actually uh, a university uh, has the ability to be the curator of content, to contextualize it, in terms of the degree discipline that's being taught and ensure that the student comes out with a well-rounded um, education. But that content can come from third parties and particularly from leading institutions and companies from around the world that complement the skill sets that, that the, the academic and faculty staff have. There's a second part that we're starting to see as universities uh, and educational institutions, as, they, as they're moving into more of an online uh, provision, they're moving into also having to privately author their own content in a manner that's fit for uh, online consumption. And so having platforms that enable organizations to create projects, to create assessments, to create courses that are designed for that online world is becoming a bigger requirement. And that's often a new skill set uh, in many organizations. And it's not easy to create content designed for an online audience and can also be expensive to do so. We're also seeing that Online doesn't have to be passive, right? It doesn't have to be just watching, say, videos, talking heads, or reading materials. It can be very hands-on in terms of the learning. And there's lots of mechanisms. In Coursera, we, we use guided projects and we use labs, but it's about having engaged learning where you can do coding assessments, you can do programming, you can do lab work, you can do technology interaction, you can do platforms, you can do Excel, whatever it might be but using data sets in a safe virtual environment to apply real hands-on skills to truly embed learning in a far more effective way than simply watching passively um, other material. And then there's, again, as I mentioned earlier on, there's a big focus on ensuring that there are job-ready skills being taught, irrespective of the curriculum, irrespective of the learning discipline or the degree program that you might be taking, that there are certain base level job-ready skills that are being built into the programs to increase your, um, your employability outcomes when you emerge from the university. And of course, all this has to be done in a high quality way. Um, it has to be at a low cost of provision uh, online. It has to be done at scale. It has to be done with academic integrity. So looking at how you deal with things like plagiarism, how you look at ensuring that um, tests are being done without any cheating taking place, and how you also make it appropriate for all of your audience recognizing that some people may not have easy access to the internet or have high costs of internet access, may not have a, a computer at home, so be able to access it through both work, mobile and other forms of devices. And all of this is, in many cases, a completely new way of delivering educational content, which creates its own sort of challenges for organizations. So when we think in Coursera about content, we kind of think about creating sort of stackable content paths. So you can have very simple projects, which are, take up a short amount of time, typically you know, 30 minutes to a couple of hours, often hands-on applied forms of learning, learning that can complement um, perhaps more faculty-driven lectures. 
Um, you then move into more formalized um, courses, which is typically combinations of video, uh, readings, assessments, which is more the way you might deliver a module within a university setting. Um, into what we would call specializations, where you're building deep domain level of knowledge of expertise over multiple hours of learning, perhaps 60 or 90 hours of learning, which is typically done over a number of months of time. Um, we also have uh, in Coursera category, we call professional certificates, which I will come into a second, uh, which are driven actually by industry organizations and have an external recognition value of being preparing you for foundational roles and are very powerful in driving career outcomes. And then of course there are organizations that are moving to offer fully online degrees. We host a number of them on the Coursera platform. There are already a number of universities that are fully online in everything that they do. And of course there are very established universities who are offering uh, online degrees either directly themselves or through a platform like Coursera. And once you start offering online degrees, of course you have the potential to attract students from anywhere in the world. Equally, you have competition from anywhere in the world. So it becomes a very different um, challenge in which students you recruit, how you retain them, how you differentiate your brand. So there's a real range in the way content can be delivered in an online or blended manner. And it's really about identifying the best approach to move into this world based on your prior experience, your starting point, and the particular dynamics of your um, organization and the markets that you serve. Now, if you look at it um, in terms of, again, where we're seeing some of the fastest growing job roles, we're seeing things in such as robotics, engineers, AI specialists, lots of AR and VR jobs, um, internet things. These are roles where right now there just isn't enough um, uh, supply of people which have those skill sets. So building some of these skills into different programs will make them much more powerful. And so when you look at things like these are different disciplines, for example, computer science, bringing in specific focuses around AI, cybersecurity, data science, et cetera, will make those students much more employable. Um, if you're looking at mechanical engineering, you know, robotics, um, additive manufacturing, automation, utilization of advanced materials, um, in chemical, battery technology, smart plant design, micro devices. Right? These are all kind of skill sets that we are seeing from our data set um, and from third party reports are in demand in the workforce today. And by helping empower your students to access some of those skill sets, you're going to actually find, you know, drive those, those superior outcomes. If you're looking at specifically at private authoring, you know, this is a key requirement to delivering blended uh, learning at scale. Now, you can obviously buy in third party content, but most organizations will also want to deliver faculty generated content in an online capacity as well. And then in order to do that effectively, you need to actually create privately authored content. In other words, content that you yourself own the intellectual property of, and you can control who can access it under what circumstances and at what kind of price or cost metrics in accordance with how much you charge for educational access. Um, so we have, as of course, our private authoring toolkit. Of course, you can do this in many other different ways. Um, but it's about doing that in a way that's scalable uh, easily and quickly. And the way I always think about this is, when you go to university and you're watching faculty give a presentation, it's a little bit like going to watch a play in a theater. You know, you're up front with the staff, it's, it's interactive, it's live, it's, it's all focused around the, the, the single screen, the faculty member and so on. If you wanted to do something online, then it, it, you can't simply record that play and then put it as a recorded object out to your user base. That that's a little bit like taking a play and then trying to show it in a cinema screen. A movie going audience is gonna look for very different content to a theater going audience. It's designed differently, it's created differently, it's engages in a very different way. And there's a requirement not just to build the expertise, but to be able to create content at scale in a rapid way that works as part of a university curriculum that has a pedagogical design behind it and has all the kind of plagiarism and anti-plagiarism anti capabilities built into it, but can also be modified quickly as content changes, managed effectively and distributed 
as part of that overall curriculum, which is no small thing to go and do. And it's something that I said, many organizations actually don't have the resources or the experience of doing, but are now being forced into this new world as a result of the, the, the changes that kind of force acceleration uh, of this transformation as a result of COVID. Um, similarly, we have um, things such as labs um, where you can work with real world applications like Jupyter or Unity or Tableau um, through a virtual environment without having to have licenses for the software, without having to download them on your computers, be able to use pretty much any kind of um, browser enabled device uh, with an internet connection to actually engage in real, one, real world hands-on projects this example here from Coursera is where you have an instructor um, on the uh, on the right hand side of the screen taking you through it recorded. Um, so this isn't live; this is pre-recorded. And you on the left hand side, as the um, as the student, will be able to engage with the technology, real world technology. So you can follow along with the instructor. But you can also go and do other different things and experiment in a completely safe environment with a data set that's pre pre-designed to meet the objectives, the learning objectives of that course. And so when you look at the, the labs that we do as Coursera, we've already seen 5.5 million student enrollments in lab type assignments with the content we have. So we're already seeing pretty significant engagement on a global stage with this kind of way of engaging with technology and two and a half million students who are engaged in guided projects, which is just another form of hands-on learning. So collectively about uh, approaching 8 million uh, enrollments we've seen that are done in a very hands-on applied way but through an online medium. Um, we also have today on the Coursera platform 10 fully online technical degrees, which also make use of labs. We've got 27,000 degree students who are actually um, taking um, enrollments on those labs. So it's becoming part of the way in which you deliver these kind of degrees. And we're seeing from our data that there's a much higher completion rate uh, in courses which have these practical assignments. They are much better at engaging students in the course material when you make them apply, when you make them engage courses rather than simply passive ones. And we also see that there's a demonstrative increase in the skills development that has been done when you use auto-graded assignments to actually measure course progression because it forces students to actually engage with the material and to apply it and then do tests on it to embed that skills development. So there's certain patterns that we're starting to identify and see in the ideal way in which these courses can be delivered. Professional certificates are, is, are specific courses that have been de designed by um, global organizations. And you can see the list that we have here, like Google, IBM, Salesforce, Facebook, et cetera. And these are in-depth courses, usually a series of courses around a particular thing, which have been produced by these organizations. And they are certifications so for example, you know, IBM have a cybersecurity analyst role. The idea behind this is if you complete that course, you have a certification that IBM are basically saying is, like, we consider this individual to have the skills needed to go into an entry level cybersecurity role. And those are certificates that when a student gets those that they can publicize in their LinkedIn profile, they can actually uh, put them on their CV they are what we call gateway credentials because they can be the gateway into a first job for a student because they have an external validated value to an organization that they recognize that they bring a set of skill sets relevant to that role that can be truly differentiating in actually helping that individual get that, that job. And this is an example of where we're seeing a much tighter cohesion between educational institutions and businesses because by educational institutions giving students the opportunity to engage with this type of content puts them in a far stronger competitive position when they're going to the job market when compared to those students who don't have access to the same learning opportunities. As I said, you know, Pilot Online is also ensuring that it has high academic integrity. If you can teach your way through assignments and exams online, then they become devalued in the eyes of the employer, in the eyes of the university, and indeed the eyes of the student who is conscientiously looking to complete their work. So any program like this also has to build in things like how do you deal with plagiarism? How do you actually detect it in the first place? How do you make sure exams are private so you don't have access to the material? How can you use randomized question banks to make sure that when questions are presented, 
that the student can't simply refer to a pre-copied set of answers on the internet and just report those through. How do you actually make sure that it is actually the student themselves who's taken that exam and not someone who's taken it on their behalf? So there's a lot of focus that has to be done in how you build this, which is much easier to manage on campus. It's a very different problem in an online world, which universities have to figure a solution path for. Um, and then finally, you have to make sure that you are offering solutions that uh, provide the greatest possible access to students, regardless of their means. And that means you have to recognize that people will want to engage with content through different um, forms of media, from desktops, tablets, mobiles, etc. that people may not have reliable or um, uh, inexpensive internet access, and so want to be able to work offline or actually will have to download content, but need to do it at the lowest possible bandwidth cost possible. And so have low data download options and also having ways in which you can interact um, with communities, with notes, with writing transcripts on these devices so that you're not disadvantaged because of your limited access to technology compared to perhaps other students that you might be bringing into the program. And by bringing all of these things together, you have an ability to transform the outcomes for your students in the sense of ensuring that you're building in demand career and human skills that will enable people to drive um, improved outcomes and career choices. They will have an ability to actually build really strong multidisciplinary um, uh, individuals that can move into a range of different career paths because of a, a wide range of skill sets they have, which means not just trapped into the degree subject they study, and that they have a very strong grounding in kind of emerging cutting edge technology topics, literacy level understanding that will allow them to adapt to the ever changing landscape that they'll be moving into. And this will both aid the university to be recognized as a leading destination of choice for universities to go to because the outcomes it helps to deliver. And for students, it will improve their career outcomes and their life outcomes as a consequence of engaging with programs in this way. So that's a fairly quick canter through how we're seeing this landscape um, evolve and engage. And I know we're on time, so I'm going to stop the share there and hand back over. Thanks a lot. It was very interesting and actually really amazing results. Uh, do we have time for a couple of questions? Let's do just, just two minutes of quick questions and then I will have to jump to another call. Okay. Uh, then one question. You mentioned then uh, uh, that in modern world uh, you need to compete in with uh, everyone all around the world. Uh, so how does this stratify society and uh, is it necessary to tie education to specific physical universities? Uh, it, certainly, it certainly isn't and there's lots of forms of education of course which are done outside of the university sphere. And there are of course university programs where you can access those programs from anywhere in the world. The question about competing anywhere in the world is fundamentally comes down to, do you need to be in country, in the city, in a specific location to engage with that program? And how much time needs to be spent there? If you only need to go there for a few days a year, you know, it's can you afford to do the travel? And if so, you can then learn anywhere in the world. If you don't need to be there at all, and of course you can engage anywhere in the world, but that opens things up. And so, Whereas before, if you were based in the UK, you'd probably go to a UK university. Whereas now you might actually want to study in Russia, in South Africa, in the US. If you can do that online without having to move out of the UK, you certainly expand your options. You may of course still be very interested in traveling abroad and working in another country for you know, the, the interest in life that that brings. But it does create a more open marketplace. It will create more opportunity for students, more competition potentially with the university sphere. And generally more competition drives more innovation and more, op more options, which is probably a good thing for the overall market. Thanks a lot, Anthony, uh, for investing your time for Ukrainian students. Uh, hope to see you in Ukraine, maybe someday. We look forward to the world opening up and we can all travel again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a pleasure to talk to you today. Yeah, thank you. Bye. And I uh, want to uh, tell a little announcement that in two weeks we are, talk, we are going to talk with Barbara Oakley, author of Great Course Learning How to Learn on Coursera. So, fantastic. She is a fantastic speaker. You'll be in great hands. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Goodbye for now. <laughs>